We'll move from Helsinki to Global South, say Mexico, Guatemala, Republic of Congo, I think. And we'll, uh, in the beginning, we'll start uh, with looking at some specific cases you actually are familiar with. And I would ask you to introduce yourself and your uh, field topic at the moment with the pictures. I think Anja Nykren, uh, you can start. Yes. Good afternoon for everyone. I'm Anja Nykren. I'm professor of development studies at the University of Helsinki. I'm also affiliated professor of Helsinki Sustainability Science Center and Helsinki Inequality Initiative. I'm doing research currently in Mexico on urban risks and vulnerabilities. Uh, strongly segregated cities, they have huge divisions based on social position. But they are also places of great diversity. In order to understand those cities, I think we, we need to be able to change our perspectives and to let our assumptions to turn upside down. People do not live in isolated worlds in segregated cities. There are many kinds of encounters between peoples from different parts of the city. The problem is that these encounters are often very hierarchical. Uh, so, uh, 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 even if you are poor and marginalized, this does not mean that you wouldn't have aspirations to live with dignity to be respected and to feel safe and secure. So these kind of uh, houses, I think they are a very nice example how people also want to have nice houses, even if they are poor. Where, where are the houses? They are from Mexico. Okay. From. These kind of informal electricity connections, they are called diablitos, like small devils in Mexico. Uh, if the government does not build basic, uh, uh, or does not provide basic services for poor neighborhoods, people have to build them by themselves. However, these connections are not totally informal or illegal because often the governments are invisibly supporting them to gain votes of the poor people. This picture is from Villa Hermosa in Mexico, and people wanted the city registers to give uh, street names, or, or different kind of professions uh, to, their, uh, to, to give names that resemble different kind of professions for their streets, because they said that the street of anthropologists or the street of geographers it sounds so official that we are more recognized. Hmm. Uh, uh, inequality can be noticed in segregated cities in many ways. It's, it's explicit and it's implicit. Uh, in, the, in the photo that we saw, there was a painting that was saying that we need equ equality. But it, beside the the painting, there was an official sign which said, informal trading prohibited in this marketplace. This picture is from Villa Hermosa. In many cities of the global south, there are efforts to displace poor people and informal uh, traders from strategic sites of the cities. And one of the placards in this, uh, in this picture says it's the, it's the demonstration of, of informal traders who, who are displaced from the city center. And one of the placards says, we are also the center. And the other placard says, we as semi-fixed traders are the cultural tradition of the city center. So it tells us that the poor people are not just like passive victim, victims of displacements, but they try to also 
reinvent the meanings and to contest such kind of efforts, also with different degrees of power. Thank you, Anja. Can you explain one more time, what did you mean when you say that there are connections between rich and the poor? You said that you want to kind of turn the common um, thought upside down. What kind of connections? Yes, I, I think uh, in, in conventional research we have thought that people live in, in very isolated places, that they, there are no encounters. But mm. I think there are everyday encounters. For example, many poor people, they work in allied neighborhoods as maids, mm. as security guards, as, uh, as gardeners and so on. And also the, the uh, rich people, they go to the middle side, side uh, middle uh, class places, for example, for cafeterias, mm. because they have much nicer, much more uh, li lively cafeterias than those elite uh, gated communities. And they also, middle class people also then, for example, when they want to repair some of their items, they go for poor neighborhoods to work for people in metal workshops to repair their items. So there are mm. encounters, but they are very hierarchical. Right. Very like everyday stuff. You would go to a store or marketplace or have someone to clean your house and something like that. And yeah. they are encounters. That's, that's a good point as well. We can talk about it later. That's so that w when, when we say that the, the cities are segregated or divided, we also say that there are connections between the areas. Okay, uh, Florencia Quesada, mm -hmm. uh, actually from University of Helsinki, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, but your pictures and your research is done in, in Guatemala City, is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Florencia Quesada. I'm a researcher at the University of Helsinki and I'm an adjunct, adjunct professor in Latin American studies as well at the University of Helsinki. I'm originally from Costa Rica, but I've been doing in the last years uh, research in Guatemala. Uh, I am a historian by training, so I have been doing uh, an urban history urban cultural history about the Guatemala City. I'm writing a book at the moment about the, uh, the post-colonial city process of transformation at the end of the 19th century until 1930s and how that colonial city uh, were transformed through several issues like uh, ideology, public ser services, the changes in the public space. And also uh, I'm analyzing the imaginaries of that urban transformation through literature, uh, uh, descriptions or travel descriptions from from uh, travelers from Europe and and and, uh, and the United States, and at the same time through photography to try to understand how that process of of, of urban change goes hand in hand with with that modernization. But at the same time, and currently, I'm also working uh, with uh, precisely Anya. Uh, in an Academy of Finland funded project about fragile cities in the global south. And I am working in uh, risk communities or precarious settlements because we don't want to use the word slums because it's very pejorative. And uh, I'm uh, working in uh, the northern part of Guatemala City uh, in Zone 18. It's called where the majority of the population, uh, poor population is living and it's regarded one of the most dangerous uh, parts of the city. And uh, so in this project, uh, that it's a comparative uh, 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 project between different cities, Villahermosa in Mexico, Guatemala City also in Bogota in Colombia and Calcutta in India, uh, I'm, I'm dealing with Guatemala City and I'm focusing precisely on violence and environmental risks uh, in, in these uh, precarious settlements. And that is uh, more or less uh, some of the photos you were seeing. Um, this is one of the rivers that goes through, through one of those risk uh, communities. And uh, these uh, spaces are really far away and very different conditions from uh, of course, uh, the Nordic countries, and um, well, I'm trying to analyze how they deal with uh, violence and, and environmental risks, because uh, Guatemala is one of the, the countries in the world uh, most violent, with the highest homicidal rates in the world, 
and at the same time, it's uh, very prone to uh, the whole Central American region. It's prone to one of the areas uh, most prone to climate change. So uh, there is a great impact on both uh, on both phenomena through uh, earthquakes, uh, volcanic eruptions, uh, uh, tropical storms. So the combination of all these negative things uh, has, of course, a great impact on the dwellers of, of these uh, spaces. And, and these we, we can see in these uh, precarious settlements, of course, uh, this is a long process uh, of urban segregation. It's n something that it's not new. We have to go and see the roots in, in, in history as well. Mm -hmm because this process of urban segregation started already at the beginning of the 20th century in, in uh, caused by those uh, uh, natural disasters precisely. In Guatemala City, there was a big earthquake in 1917, 18, and since then, those poor people were completely uh, uh, relegated and the state never offered their, uh, them um, a solution. So since then, they have been uh, living on the fringes of that society, and uh, it, they keep on, on accumulating uh, the problems. And in the 1950s, 60s, there was a great process of urban migration from the countryside to the cities. Uh, and uh, since the, the state uh, doesn't provide a place to live, they have to go and invade those places where you are not supposed to live, which are uh, some of the photos you see here are the ravines. Uh, Guatemala City is surrounded by these ravines, geographically speaking. Those places where well, people are not supposed to live in those places. But nowadays, uh, uh, these uh, ravines, uh, they uh, are 42% of the, uh, constitute 42% of the geography of Guatemala City and 2% of these precarious settlements are located in these spaces. And the two communities that I'm analyzing are precisely uh, uh, located in these ravines. And these are the photos, the same Diablitos as, as Anya was showing. Uh, and uh, they are uh, located in, in, in those ravines. So it's uh, high uh, sp urban spaces with high uh, degrees of violence on one side and uh, uh, poverty. Uh, certainly, but also many other uh, problems that they have to deal with daily. And uh, Guatemala City is one of the most segregated uh, uh, urban spaces uh, as well around the world. And because the divisions, uh, the inequalities, again, is one of the most unequal countries uh, in the world. The elite there is so powerful and so rich and in so little, and the majority of the population in Guatemala, uh, in general terms, 60% are living in, in poverty in, in the country, and 60% of the population is indigenous as well. There is a face of poverty in, 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 in uh, or represented in indigenous people. So all these problems are reflected in the urban spaces that are completely segregated and, uh, and uh, unequal and with lots of, of urban problems. So these are like uh, some sides of, of, the, of those uh, phenomena. This, for example, it's a photo of the, in front of the community that I'm uh, analyzing. It is controlled by the maras or the gangs, which is one of the major problems in the, in the city of Guatemala. Uh, very violent and uh, those are like uh, the no-go zones or the the, these spaces that are uh, absent from, uh, we call these uh, fragile, fragile states and fragile cities because the, the, the state, they don't have a say in, in all these different spaces and, and, and that is a, a good example of that. Marcia, what is the public opinion in Guatemala, if there is any, about the segregation and the divided cities? Is it something that you know, people want to change? Or is it the kind of status quo thing that this is how things are? Yeah, well, uh, the history of Guatemala, it's very complex. There was uh, more than 30 years of civil war. So it is a post-conflict uh, society as well. And uh, it's very, it has had very authoritarian regimes throughout his, its history as well. So democracy, it's a really um, fragile <laughs> word, if you can say it, uh, in Guatemala. There's a lot of corruption and there's a lot of impunity as well. So that's why all these problems can flourish in this type of societies because, because of, of the absence of the state 
in so in so many different ways. And so I've been doing research there for more than 10 years already, and it always uh, surprises you how how can things get not better but even worse, and people they get normalized into that statu quo in the sense that. Uh, I mean, there should be a revolution there <laughs> simply and try to change everything. But uh, simply, of course, the elite is so powerful and it's difficult to change uh, things there. They just, uh, there has been just an election a month ago and then it's just keep on reproducing the same, the same political problems. And, and uh, of course, there is no bigger s solutions because there's a very powerful elite behind the power mm -hmm. that it's really uh, controlling everything what's happening in the, the public uh, You live in Helsinki now. How does it seem to you, looking uh, from this perspective? Well, I, I've, I've been in, living in Helsinki for 17 years, mm. but I have been going back and forth mm. throughout all these years. And it's always, for me, as a Central American, it's really sad always to go back and, and forth and see those realities. And that's why mm. I do what I do for mm. my work, in order to, to try of course, you cannot uh, find, uh, change the, the system, but at least by my research, try to understand, okay, these are the origins of these problems, and how can we reverse those, those processes? But of course, it's, it's, for me, it's, it's always sad, especially, for example, doing this field work in these uh, uh, precarious uh, settlements. I, I was working with a local NGO, Perpendicular, uh, founded by two architects, and we were doing the field work there. And it's been one of the most difficult periods as a researcher in my life to do that because it's very dangerous, the area. So thinking psychologically to live in those uh, spaces of fear, uh, as it is called, it's, of course, it has a profound impact. And so for me, it has been very rich in, in, in that sense to, to understand and to live in. And I, I always take the public transport the buses there, and I, I live like a regular person there. And of course, it, it really goes into your heart to, to see, try to, to find some, some solution in whatever the little thing you can do as a researcher. And I've been very, really grateful living in Finland, so far away from, from Central America, but still that I've, I've been able to get fund, funding for, to do my research there. And I think it's really important to to keep on doing it, yeah. Thank you, Florencia. Uh, Philip, uh, the book, is it so? The From book, Belgium. Yes. And From but Belgium. with the pictures and research, we'll move all the way to... Congo. Congo. To Central Africa. Yes. Central Africa, right, King Sasa. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much for inviting me in this wonderful infrastructure. Uh, mm. It's the first time I, I come to Helsinki, so Welcome. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> And um, I'm an anthropologist. I work at the University of Leuven in Belgium, and uh, mostly an urban anthropologist, I would say. And for the past 20 years, I've been uh, researching, working in and about the, the city of Kinshasa, which is the Democratic Republic of Congo's uh, capital. And Congo itself is one of the largest cities on the African continent. And so is its, its capital. It's actually sub-Saharan Africa's uh, second largest city after Lagos, Nigeria, a city of today 12 to 15 million. We don't really know because the last population census was in 1984, so the, the, the population numbers are just extrapolations from these older uh, figures. Mm. And, um, and so over the years I've been uh, looking at, uh, first of all, uh, the, the kind of, as you said, uh, the uh, urban imaginaries. Uh, we here mm. in Belgium, I suppose in Finland, we have a, a, a great belief in the, the, the force of the, the, the built form uh, to, to socially engineer space. And, 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 uh, but what happens if you live in a city where there is no built form, where material infrastructure is mm. anything but functioning. Uh, it, it's, it's defined by its paucity, by its scarcity, by its uh, breaking down and so on. Where there is no architecture to speak of, or where architecture is reduced to a kind of zero degree form, where housing is shelter, uh, having a roof above your head and that's, that's it. So, and yet, so that is the, the case in Kinshasa, uh, in terms of water, electricity, uh, in built infrastructure, 
there is barely anything, let's say, and yet you have uh, an urban agglomeration of 12 million people which has invented a certain style of urbanness, urbanity. And so a lot of my work was, was around you know, what, what is the, the city as a state of mind, in a way, as a, as a kind of a mental landscape with all of its aspirations, all of its desires, all of its uh, hopes, and, and so on. In more recent work, together with um, a Congolese photographer whose pictures you're uh, watching at the moment, his name is Sami Baloji. Uh, uh, we, together with him, I've been uh, I've published a, a new book which looks more at material forms and material infrastructures, sometimes leftovers like this building of the colonial period uh, that people reappropriate and where they invent a new kind of uh, urban living, uh, new forms of urban life, uh, or sometimes um, starting from just uh, yeah, the, the, the defaults of the, of the existing infrastructure, a pothole and what you can do with it. And so we've been looking at, at the material landscape, the surface of the city in, in, uh, and to, to pinpoint or to, to do what I call urban acupunctures of specific places where people come together and where new forms of life emerge in a way. Um, so that has been... And so the question then becomes uh, where, uh, how can people live and live together and how does that living together how is that defined and how does that come about uh, in those dire circumstances uh, and so that is something that we that i've I mean, been busy with doing over the past uh, couple of years uh, philip we i think we all know uh, the thing called american dream what does an african dream look like looking from there what is that? You mentioned desires of the people. What kind well, of desires? It depends who you're talking about. Sure. And, and, uh, but let's say um, Congo was a Belgian colony. Mm -hmm. Its colonization was a very effective one in the sense that it really instilled people. It, it, it imposed a model of what it meant to be a, a modern uh, uh, citizen, uh, 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 a modern subject in a way. And even after independence, which came in, in Congo in 1960, the kind of the decolonization of, of the, the, the mind, so to speak, uh, that, that model that was so much of colonialist modernity, that was so much imposed upon people, continued to work and, and still continues to, to exert its effect. And you see that in, even in the, um, in the planning of the city itself, of course, as many cities in Africa, uh, Kinshasa too is a, a colonial invention. Mm? It, it emerged at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. Not that there aren't any uh, cities, pre-colonial cities in Africa. We have many examples, Chene, Timbuktu, uh, Banza Congo, uh, and so on. So huge urban agglomerations long before the arrival of the European colonizer, even before the, the, the influence of Islam uh, around the year 1000. So all of that is there, but a lot of other cities have emerged as colonial inventions and basically were never uh, made to, to exist as a city as such or, or never in an equal way. They were from the start segregated uh, worlds. Uh, Kinshasa very clearly, you had what is called La Ville, the city, the central downtown, which was for white expats, uh, civil servants, uh, diplomats and so on. And around that you had what was called the Cité, uh, a kind of peripheral city for Africans. Basically, uh, that, that, that African city was uh, where barracks to, to store cheap labor force and, uh, and, and the, who could then be put to work in the, the colonial industries. Uh, and so that was a very segregated world, uh, the, the, the white and, and the black city and the African city. They were even physically I mean, put apart from each other by what they called uh, zone tampon or tampon zones or uh, uh, cordon sanitaire, healthcare mm -hmm. uh, 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 corridors. And they were built the, the span of the fly of a mosquito. Of, um, supposedly a mosquito can fly 700 meters. Right. And so they were built uh, the, these, these empty corridors between black and white were, were at that width so that African diseases couldn't spread to the white city. So right from the start, there was this segregation in terms of 
I mean, race, mm. a color bar that was imposed and that still continues to exert its influence. It was right from the start also a very segregationist city in terms of gender. Mm. As many cities throughout Africa, the city was a male space. Mm. Yeah? On the white colonialist side, there were basically men, all these civil servants and colonial administrators. The families came only after the Second World War. Uh, and on the African side too, well, Africans were brought to these places and what was needed was labor force, so men. And, um, and so the few women uh, that, that were part of, of colonial cities before, let's say, 1950, after the Second World War, uh, had a special status and were very often working as prostitutes, were allowed by the colonial uh, administration to, to do that. So very segregated realities. Now, in the meantime, a city like Kinshasa, who counted 40,000 people after around the Second World War, let's say 1945. At the time of its independence, 1960, 400,000 people. So from 1945 to 1960, ten a tenfold increase, uh, the, the really uh, already then a demo uh, demographic explosion. In 1970, one million, and today, let's say 12 million. Mm -hmm. At the same time, urban planning, formal urban planning stopped in 1960. Uh, when, when the Belgian colonizer left. So that means that a huge part of this immense city was added on in a very chaotic, non-planned way. At first, I mean, people just continued to follow the grid of the colonial urban planning, and then that grid undid itself, unraveled, and became something else. So the whole, the whole city, millions of people who, who grew away from these imposed models, uh, uh, modernist and, and Western models, and turned the city into something else, into, into their own, in, in, into its own uh, uh, reality, uh, uh, an urban universe that does no longer correspond fully to these Western and European dreams. Today, we see the, uh, a new development as throughout Africa and many other parts of the world, Latin America, no doubt, too. Uh, you have a kind of neoliberal city, let's say, uh, very often in all kinds of forms of enclaved uh, cities, either gated communities, satellite cities, uh, charter cities, uh, the famous charter city of uh, the, the guy who recently won the Nobel Prize, Paul uh, Romer um, oh, from Stanford. Yeah. Uh, so the, a city that you build next to an existing city and that can act as a kind of platform uh, outside of control and so on, uh, an economic platform. Um, and, and so a lot of these city models are being applied on the African continent, also in Congo. Uh, and you see how they replay, in a way, the segregationist or the exclusionist geography of the colonial city, uh, between rich and poor, between white and black, uh, and at the same time add on to that uh, the aesthetics of, of uh, I mean, the new hotspots, urban hotspots of the global south, Dubai, uh, Doha, and, and so on and so forth. So, so, but it, it's partly a re replay of a very colonial urban planning, partly also uh, uh, yeah, uh, urban, urban, um, urban forms that come into existence through neoliberal capital and uh, very often venture capital that in itself is, I mean, floats around, is difficult to capture. And, uh, and the people who build these cities, whether or not they're constructed, whether or not they're inhabited, doesn't really count. They, are, they can be hatched against future projects and it becomes a kind of capital vehicle, really. Uh. Thank you. Anya, I wanted to ask you, because we saw the pictures and the little boys in the uh, Guatemala pictures, you remember them? Is there any possibility for them to uh, go up in the social ladders in terms of, let's say, money, profession or anything? Is it the destiny to be born in a, one of these places? Mm. I don't want to think that it's so fatalistic that you cannot mm. upgrade yourself, but of course it's very difficult. Uh, as we were listening those... Uh, who were speaking about the case of Helsinki, even here it's sometimes difficult for, mm -hmm. for those who have low level of education to upgrade themselves. But uh, I think in, in, in the global south it, it's still much, much more difficult uh, because uh, there, there is so much segregation and the, the decree of uh, like basic services like healthcare, education, Securities is all of those. They 
put you many constraints. But I, I, we have also cases where people have been able to upgrade themselves, so we shouldn't think that this is your destiny, you cannot do anything. What happens if you can't do it? What kind of things? You get to go to school, and then something, and then something? Yeah, I think it's, it's a vicious circle. I mean, mm. if, you do not, if you do not have the education, then it's difficult. You, you have to go and search for certain kind of jobs, and then you, are, you have to live in certain kind of places, and so on. So it's not, not so easy to upgrade. And I think it's not the, just the question of citizens themselves to try to upgrade mm. themselves. I, I, I think the state, the governmental institutions, the policies, they also have the role to try to, to uh, um, mitigate those kind of... Uh, that there wouldn't be so many barriers for people to upgrade themselves. Mm. Floresia, you talked about the violence. Why is it that the violence and the, the rates are so high compared to some other places that mm. are not doing that well either? Mm. What is the kind of the root? Can you explain a bit about the violence? Yeah, well, one of the important things uh, of violence and in, Latin Amer in the Latin American context is that violence, it's not a new phenomenon. Violence has been very much uprooted in the history of the continent since the Spanish colonization and uh, many, many centuries of, 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 of uh, violent colonization in the whole region. And in the case of, of Guatemala as well, there has been a long tradition of authoritarian regimes. And uh, we have to remember as well that Guatemala was the seat of power of the Audiencia, uh, the Guatemala, or the whole uh, administrative region of what it is now uh, known as Central America. It was the seat of power of the Spanish uh, 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 power in, in that moment. And that has determined, as well in historical terms, there was a powerful elite that until today and throughout the history has uh, consolidated and even got more richer, of course, through, throughout the history. And that has uh, determined a lot uh, the, the history in, in so many ways. And of course, the violence, it's, it's, multi, it's a, a m complex multi-phenomena that you cannot explain it for one single okay. thing. But uh, one of the problems of, of violence, it's uh, uh, inequalities. Of course, it's very much related to that. And one of the things that research uh, uh, highlights is social exclusion as one of the main drivers of violence in urban spaces in, in Latin America in, in general terms. So uh, we have a reach uh, in the 1970s uh, and a, uh, or starting in the 70s up to the 90s, all these uh, adjust uh, uh, economic uh, programs. Uh, uh, there, there was a big economic crisis in, in Latin America and there was an imposition by the uh, IMF and many others uh, that, okay, you have to uh, start transforming all the welfare s uh, states and uh, there was a constant privatization and neoliberalization of the, of the economies and the, and the societies in general terms. And that has led to uh, the creation of very uh, unequal societies in, in general terms and, and violence is expressed not because of poverty, but especially because of social exclusion. And one of those uh, uh, scapegoats of the violence nowadays are the gangs, for example. These, those are the, the, the actors that they are blamed that, oh, these are the, the ones who produces the, the violence. No, well, certainly they are one of the main actors of that, but they are a product of that social exclusion. Because the, the Maras, the origins, for example, of the Maras were not in Central America. It was in the streets of LA. And because there were uh, civil wars in El Salvador and Guatemala uh, for many, many years, and people had to flee away from their countries because there was a very violent uh, situation and no, no work. So they moved to the United States, many of those, especially to Los Angeles, and he was in the streets of Los Angeles, completely excluded from that other society, that all these gangs, the Maras uh, 18 and the Salvatrucha, were born. And in the 1990s, in a different process, uh, uh, and looting uh, in, in that 
event that happened in the city of LA and the government decided to deport most of that people back to their uh, countries of origin. And so most of those Salvadorians in Guatemala, they were sent back to their home countries, even though they have uh, arrived there many, uh, uh, they didn't even know how to speak in Spanish. They were sent back without any possibilities to societies that would not offer them anything. They just gave one euro, one dollar for them at the airport, and then you see what, <coughs> what you can do. So, of course, there's a great amount of people in those societies, urban populations, that they don't have any possibilities to survive, and they join these gangs. And, of course, another of the problem, I mean, there, there's uh, so many different factors that determines violence, and it's, of course, the uh, illicit drugs and the, the whole production of uh, drug production in, in Colombia, Central America, because of all the uh, policies of the United States and the uh, Washington consensus and many, many other uh, uh, reasons, they, uh, they uh, started uh, put, putting more controls to the drug production, illegal production through air. And so most of now the, uh, the, the illegal production goes through land through Central America. And that has added another factor that has complicated more this uh, and, and create more violent societies. Uh, as, so we keep on adding all, all these different problems. And of course, there is a, a lot of, of it, it's a complex situation, not a, one single thing, but history and path dependent and, and, and uh, structures. And uh, Francia said before that things are getting, getting worse. Well, uh, Philip. Uh, what, do, what do you do you see in terms of things getting worse or better? Any signs of hope? Anything nice happening? You have <laughs> talked about uh, the image we have uh, about uh, mm -hmm. Western Africa in, in the in the West. Yeah. It's not easier to interview mm. academics. They they tend to lecture and talk too much. It's okay to lecture a bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah well, it get, does it get better or worse? Uh, I, I don't know. That's that's too broad a question. I think people. Um, Any signs of hope? Let's put mm? it this way. Mm. Well, uh, and what uh, are uh, they? There's a long tradition of describing all of these these cities in in very dystopic terms. Mm. You know, yeah. as something that does not function. That is, uh, mm. I mean, basically not not working. Where people are reduced as to 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 become victims and so on. Of course, I mean, and a lot of our work, I think, tries to prove the the opposite. That people are active participants mm. and and, and create Creators with their own economic, political, religious agendas, and who make the city, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, very often these cities do not function uh, the, in, in, a, in, a, in, in, in the way that we expect cities to function. Uh, but so that, uh, the, that also means that, that people do have a, uh, and do have a vision of uh, and, and do have a vision of where they want to go and, and what they want with their city. What they want. If you ask them, is there hope? They will always say, oh yes. But then. If you ask them, okay, what is the roadmap to arrive at that at that point in a distant future? Very often, uh, how do we get there? Then, very often, there is a silence because people cannot afford to uh, yeah, to, to to plan uh, uh, far ahead in time. Even to straddle the divide between today and tomorrow is sometimes already difficult. In in uh, wh where am I going to find food? What am, where am I going to find money? And so on. So even even 24 hours planning ahead is already difficult. Let alone plan for for a, a, a longer. Uh, uh, but that doesn't mean that people don't have uh, dreams about what they want the mm. urban world to be. That's also part of the reason why, even though they they continue the, the segregationist character of of of, of, uh, of older colonial cities, these new cities. Uh, and and uh, that are being built and constructed, uh, people that it, it instigates far less conflict than I thought it would be uh, do. Uh, uh, people are thrown off land, uh, new things emerge, and even though they know that they are never going to be able to live there, that they will never be able to afford it, that it's not for them, even then people say, yeah, but it still makes us proud to live in a country where you People, eh, where the, the government can build things like that, or where, so they're aesthetically, or it's, it, it instigates hope, even if it's not for you, <laughs> um, and that comes back to the political. Why 
as in, uh, in Guatemala, in Congo, there hasn't been so far uh, an Arab Spring, let's say, mm. 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 even though the overwhelming majority of the city is young. 75% of these 12 million people are under the age of 25. And out of those, those 75%, more than half is unemployed. So why doesn't it explode? I think it's because of that there is no middle class, uh, so people cannot materially sustain protest in, 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 in the long run. You can't afford to go and stand on a square for a month to, to, to topple the government because after two, three days you've run out of food and then you need to ha hustle again to, in order to make a living. And so people cannot afford that. But also because they have learned that you know, it's, it's not the state. It's the state, if anything, is, is an instigator of violence and defines violence. Uh, uh, so you, you can't rely on that. You can rely on yourself. And what people really, I mean, politically speaking, do more than uh, outside of, of a, a formal institutionalized political system is a politics of presence. You have your own body. You can, you can occupy a place. You can make it your own. And then, no doubt, somebody else will come mm -hmm. with a similar claim. You have to leave, the police will chase you. you, you turn your back, and then when the police is gone, you can come back. Or, but it's, 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 and you have that body to, to work with, and, to, to, and that's how, how the city comes about. That's in a very organic, unplanned, chaotic way. It creates its own tissue. Uh, and, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll have time for really short comments from you and then you know because we are running out of time okay. we'll we'll have the questions afterwards so very short comments please Anja yeah. and Florencia. No, i just want to yes. say but because maybe i put this very ho horrible pessimistic image of Guatemala mm -hmm. city but mm -hmm. uh, of course cities are always spaces of opportunities and i i, I as philippe was saying this is always uh, People, they live in these cities and uh, there are, of course, a wide range of social classes. I, I just presented that stream sure. poverty and there are middle classes and there are many different parts of the, of the city and spaces. And actually, in the, the, my last trip, I was really surprised to see that there was an urban renovation in the historical center and there was a, 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 a renovation of the public space and there has been an improvement in that uh, part of the city for the popular classes, and there are some really small things, and but of course, always cities are those spaces for opportunities for the for the people, and that that's where they find their hope for the future as well. In many cases, so that's for sure. Yeah, Anya. Yeah, I, I just want to point two issues. When we speak about divided city, I think it's not just like two divisions. There are many kind of divisions mm -hmm. and many kind of mm -hmm. diversities, many kind of yeah. heterogeneities. And the second point which I would like to, to make is that often when we look at, for example, why, there are, why the public transportation is, is not functioning in poor neighborhoods, why there are no uh, good uh, schools and so on, we easily say that it's because of the lack of resources and it's because of the inadequate planning. But I think there are, there are more there. Uh, in many of these countries, the governments are heavily controlling those poor neighborhoods, and at the same time, so they are heavily present there, but at the same time, they are strongly absent. Mm -hmm. Absent in the sense of not providing services, mm -hmm. but uh, present in the sense that they are all the time controlling who can live where and which kind of uh, standards they have to, uh, to uh, um, the houses, uh, what kind of standards you need for your housing, for your living, for your behaving and so on. So it's much more complicated, like strong presence and strong absence. Mm. Thank you, Anya.